So what we're going to do now is we're going to begin our coverage of concurrency. But before we do that, we're first going to take a short detour and cover sequential programming concepts. And this will demonstrate the meaning of the key concepts associated with sequential programming, which basically, in a nutshell, are that each step in a program is executed in order, one at a time. And understanding sequential programming, which you probably already know largely, maybe haven't thought about it that way, but if you'll see, I think you'll recognize this. It's important to understand sequential programming concepts before trying to learn and master the more advanced concurrent and parallel programming concepts, because they build on and extend and enhance sequential programming. And we'll also talk briefly about the pros and cons of sequential programming, because not everything is unicorns and rainbows. There are some downsides, which of course is what motivates concurrency. So we'll talk about the cons, and then the rest of the material, we'll start talking about how we address those cons with concurrent and parallel programming techniques. Obviously, the focus here is on concurrent techniques. I have a sibling class that I teach in the fall that covers parallel programming. So let's start out with a discussion of sequential programming. So what is sequential programming? It's a form of computing that executes the same sequence of instructions and always produces the same results. So that's just a fancy way of saying that the execution is deterministic. And what that means, what deterministic means, is that given a certain input, the same output will always be pro produced in the same order. So you can kind of think of it like going through a fast food restaurant's drive through lane, where each car is serviced in order. You place your order at the, the order placement window. You drive up to get to the payment window. If there's a payment window, you pay at the payment window. And then you might drive to the next window and pick your food up. And it's always done kind of in lockstep in order. And things are served in exactly the same way, sequentially. This deterministic property of sequential programming, of course, assumes there's no deliberate use of randomness. So if you start throwing in you know, random number generators, then your program may behave randomly. But that's not the point. The point is that things occur in a certain order assuming no deliberate use of randomness. We'll talk later, much later in the course, about how Java's fork join framework uses randomness in concurrent and parallel programs. And it's actually deliberate. They deliberately use randomness for certain purposes in order to be able to make sure that the program will have less contention for shared resources. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. So there are actually good examples of using randomness in concurrent and parallel programs. But sequential programs, for the most part, are not random. They're deterministic. There are two primary characteristics of sequential programs. First, the textual order of statements specifies their order of execution. So what, what does that mean? What that means is that here's an example from the, the get method in the ArrayList class in Java. And it, what it says is that the range check method must occur before the element data method is called, logically, in the program. If that doesn't happen, if so, for some god knows why reason element data runs before range check, chaos and insanity will ensue. Because the whole point of this is that we do this statement before that one. So the textual order of the statements specifies their order of execution. And the second characteristic of sequential programs is that successive statements must execute without any temporal overlap visible to programs or programmers. What the heck does that mean? Well, here's an example. Assume we have the code sequence A equal B plus C, and then D equal E minus A. So the value of A has to be assigned before the value of D is assigned. Because, of course, D depends on A. So if A is computed after D for some reason, D is going to have a very strange result and not what you'd expect semantically given the semantics of sequential programming in Java or C++ for that matter. However, lower layers in the solution stack can reorder instructions transparently as long as it doesn't affect the outcome of the program. So what the heck does that mean? Well, what that means is that if you have a pipeline, which most processors now have instruction pipelines, then the code that actually executes can be reordered 
to make the pipeline avoid stalls. Stalls are bubbles where nothing is getting run because an execution took too long to run. So for example, assuming A, B, C, D, and E are in memory as opposed to in um, registers, for example, and loads and stores take one clock cycle to get something in and out of memory, then instruction scheduling can eliminate pipeline stalls. And the whole, here's an example of this. So this code here could be implemented with this assembly code. So you could say load register B from memory location B, load, and that'll take one clock cycle to complete. Load register C with the value of C, that'll take one clock cycle to complete. And if you do things like this, we have to wait, we have to stall. Nothing will execute at that point because we're still waiting for C to load. And then after C has been loaded into register C, then we can add the contents of register B and C into register A. Likewise, for down here, we could take the contents of memory location A, load it into register A. Memory, uh, we would, sorry, we would store the, the value of A here into, red, uh, into location A, from register A to location A in memory. Then we would go ahead and load the memory location E into register E. Once again, there's a pipeline stall because we have to wait for the computation to finish loading. Then we could subtract uh, A from E and load it into D, and then we could store D from a register into memory. So this code here has stalls in it because the instructions aren't taking advantage of the pipelining mechanisms. Here's scheduled code that reorders things so there are no stalls. And basically the trick is simply to move the load of register E into the place where there was a stall. So now there's no pipeline stall. And then basically cleverly keep the value of A in a register and then use that to subtract. We don't have to go ahead and uh, reload it. So we can store register A to A, but then use the value in register A. And so this code here takes less instructions and doesn't in end up stalling the pipeline. But the kicker is it does the operations with the same semantic output, even though it rearranged the instructions down below. Yeah? So would this be the job of like us or the assembler? Oh, great question. So who actually does this stuff? <laughs> Mercifully, you don't have to know anything about this. This is the job of either the assembler and or the processor. So the processor may actually rearrange things in, in the pipeline process dynamically, and or the assembler may do it as well. So it's probably, today, it's probably a combination of both. So what are some of the pros and cons of sequential programming? Well, sequential programs are typically easier to write and debug. Why is that? They're intuitive because the steps that are expressed in the algorithms correspond to reading the code kind of top to bottom, left to right. So here's the code for selection sort. You can see it's happily visualizing selection sort over here. And once you know what selection sort is and how it works, this code is very straightforward. And it's easy to debug. There's no surprises. Real easy peasy, as they say. There are, no, there are no surprises here. We don't have to deal with things like race conditions or atomicity or out of order instructions having to do with multi-core processor caches, blah, blah, blah. It's very straightforward. Another nice thing is that the behavior in the debugger typically reflects the actual program behavior, unless you have things like interrupts or something, you're programming in the operating system kernel. What will happen here is that kind of what you see is what you get. You set a breakpoint, your code breaks, everything stops because you're in the, the debugger. There's only one thread, nothing else is running. And in contrast, if you're doing non-sequential programs like concurrent programs or parallel programs, then often when you're debugging them, they behave differently than when they're running in the wild. And that's because when you're stopped in one thread in the debugger, other threads are still running. The one thread is stopped, and so the behavior isn't quite the same as what would be happening in an actual execution. And that makes it harder to debug your concurrent programs. There's other reasons why concurrent programs are hard to debug too, but that's one of them. And the real consequence of this, the, the driving force, is that there are perturbations in timing from different execution contexts. So one, concurrent approaches, their debugger behavior is not the same as the actual execution, whereas in a sequential program it's much closer, unless it's a real-time program. Deterministic execution order also simplifies reasoning about 
program behavior and assuring program behavior. So it's just easier to reason about things if they occur sequentially. And this is particularly true for safety critical systems, especially systems that interact with the physical world. It's often the case that you need to make sure these things always work. The right answer computed too late becomes the wrong answer. You don't want to give someone the wrong dose of radiation. You don't want your driverless car to take a, a wrong turn and mistake something that should be a, a stop sign for a tree or whatever. And if you're dealing with you know, power grids or chemical plants or air traffic management systems, you really want to make sure that they do the right thing. And it's a lot easier to validate the behavior of single threaded programs. Of course, there's some downsides to sequential programming. The most obvious one nowadays is that it doesn't leverage all the parallelism that's available in modern multi-core systems. Modern software, modern hardware environments are really designed for multi-core execution. And as a consequence, when you use concurrent software, you can, or parallel software, you can often take advantage of all those cores. But with sequential programs, you're typically limited to just what you can get with one thread of control. So if you see the number of physical cores, then the time to, to do things, um, but this should really say, you know, you can do more things with more cores. That's the main thing to take away from that. Another issue with sequential programming is it's hard to write sequential programs that can be responsive to multiple I.O. sources and syncs. So these would include things like mouse movements, mouse clicks, touch events, GPO, GPS location signals, network connections, asynchronous storage, read and write completions, blah, blah, blah. And so as a consequence, if you're trying to do a lot of different things with one thread, you can end up with non-responsive software with things like the spinning pinwheel on Windows or the dreaded hourglass of death on uh, Apple where the user interface isn't responding properly because it's stuck waiting for I.O. somewhere. Having only a single thread of control also complicates the structure of sequential programs when you need to block. That's the problem. If you have blocking operations that block, particularly for things like I.O., then one thread of control will make it harder to write the code without doing more sophisticated patterns like asynchronous or reactive programming. Overcoming these problems, these cons, motivates everything else we're going to talk about. So everything else we're going to talk about in this course is really there to help to overcome these different limitations with sequential programming. Okay, so that's the end of our overview of sequential programming concepts.